two children. For my baby. Rub my seasoning. In. My name is Brad, and I'm a conservative Republican. Last summer, I happened to come across a video on the internet about the World Trade Center collapse on September 11th. As a kind of demolition hobbyist, I downloaded it and watched it. The title was Painful Deceptions by a guy called Eric Huffschmidt. The video made me angry. I was determined to prove the maker of this video wrong. I purchased DVDs about 9-11 from CBS and PBS Nova, including one made by the Na Day brothers. These were considered the official videos. And after watching them carefully and researching thousands of websites and archives on the internet, literally not sleeping for an entire week, I realized that the official story, not Eric Huffschmidt's painful deceptions, was unprovable, unsubstantiated, absolutely wrong. What you're about to see is information you should already know. Our news reporters, government, and media should have made all this material available to every one of us. Ask yourself why you've never seen it on TV. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, everybody. September 11th, we learned that four passenger planes were hijacked and taken radically off course. Within an hour, two of the planes had flown into the enormous steel towers of the World Trade Center, creating fires and eventually toppling them. Dazed by the news, the American public soon believed the fires in the towers had burned so hot they caused the steel frames of the buildings to give way. A myth developed, fed by official sources through the media to a bewildered audience. Elements of the myth. The impact of the airplanes, gallons of burning jet fuel, steel melting, the buildings failing and suddenly imploding. In a mere 10 seconds, 110 stories hurtled earthward, pulverizing into dust. Right from the start, on the street itself, the official story was born. Come out of nowhere and just scream right into the side of the twin tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. The myth bled into the FEMA report and was echoed by the experts. It was the combination of the impact load doing great damage to the building followed by the fire that caused collapse. John Skilling and Les Robertson were the structural engineers who designed the streamlined steel frames of the Twin Towers in the 1960s. Because a wayward army bomber flew into the Empire State Building in 1945, the towers were built with skyscraper crashes in mind. The airplane we were envisioning was the largest airplane of its time, flying slowly and low, lost in the fog. We designed the buildings to take the impact of the Boeing 707 uh, hitting the building at any location. But the aircraft that hit the towers was a Boeing 767, heavier than a 707, fueled for a transcontinental flight and traveling fast. 707s and 767s are comparable. The maximum takeoff weight of a fully loaded 707 is almost 334,000 pounds. As airplanes only carry the fuel load they need, 
the smaller model 767s that struck the towers were not, in actuality, maximally fueled or close to their maximum takeoff weight. As to the fires, listen to Chief Oreo Palmer from his radio on the South Tower's 78th floor. Isolated pockets of fire. Two water lines to knock them down. FEMA's executive summary relays that much of the fuel in the planes, jet-grade kerosene, was consumed by the initial fireballs and the following few minutes of fire. It then tells us that the burning jet fuel spread between floors and ignited the building's contents, causing more fire and generating heat. This was somehow enough to bring down the tower's 47-column steel core, 236 exterior columns, and thousands of steel trusses all at the same time. Watch the tower smoking in the aftermath of the plane strikes. If you have ever tried to light a wood fire, you will know that smoking logs tell you the fire is not burning successfully. Smoke is the sign of an oxygen-starved fire. The Twin Tower stood for over an hour, smoldering but not flaming. During that time, thousands of people were evacuated by way of the stairwells. Others, trapped by debris, stood in the smoke-filled windows and signaled for help. In fact, the towers did what they were built to do. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners because this structure is like the mosquito netting on your screen door this intense grid, and the jet plane is just a pencil puncturing that screen netting. It really does nothing to the screen netting. The towers were built to withstand 140 mile an hour gusts produced by winter storms. Anyone in them on a windy day could feel them swaying. The single impact of a jetliner was no more of a blow than the continued battering of a hurricane. I was just putting my stuff away and all of a sudden we heard a loud crash and uh, the building started shaking, kind of moving like a wave. New Yorkers were stunned one hour later when the first tower fell. To the best of my knowledge, the considerations of the fuel in the airplane in terms of, a, of, a, of an explosion or a great fire was not considered. Now, we, we were not responsible for that aspect of the design. Imagine building expressly for airplane impact, but never thinking of the fuel. Never before in the history of the world has a steel building collapsed due to fire. I have not seen, until recently, a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. True infernos have raged hot and long in steel-framed buildings, but not one of the buildings ever came down. In 1975, the World Trade Center's North Tower suffered a nighttime fire that flamed for three hours, spreading vertically from floor to floor. It burned twice as long as the fires of 9-11 without even a hint of a building collapse. In February 2005, the Windsor Tower in Madrid, a skyscraper undergoing reconstruction, sustained a 20-hour fire. This is what was left, a standing building strong enough to support a crane. Compare a 20-hour inferno to 90 minutes of smoke. Why are buildings made of steel? Strong, light and flexible, steel frames offer many advantages over wood and concrete, 
especially where skyscrapers are concerned. Steel makes big buildings relatively light, with tremendous load-bearing capacity. The upper floors won't crush the floors beneath them, and steel holds up better to weather and fire. Most skyscrapers are built on steel or concrete frames, which is a grid of columns and beams that goes all the way through the building. The World Trade Center was different. It was what engineers call a tube structure. It was a very, very strong mesh of steel that surrounded the exterior. Inside, there was the core, a rectangle of 47 columns made of four inch thick steel at the base, thinning with increasing height. The cores combined might with ingenuity, anchoring the towers and allowing them to flex. Look at the size of this steel. Solid, prefabricated floor assemblies, welded metal floor pans placed on top of trusses both welded and bolted to the vertical frames. The story we were told. This rock-like steel grid gave way because fire warped the trusses, causing the bolts to fail. As the trusses sagged and fell, the floors dropped with them. In its 2002 documentary, Why the Towers Fell, PBS creates a video model. Once the trusses failed, the floors they were holding cascade down with a force too great to be withstood. The result is what's called a progressive collapse as each floor pancakes down onto the one below. What remains standing? The tall, indestructible core. Why does PBS fail to explain the complete disappearance of the Twin Towers cores? The official story's central thesis is based on heat, temperatures high enough to weaken steel. But people in the towers did not report such heat. Think about it. Neither steel, concrete, nor glass can burn. So what in those buildings could have burned to make such heat? How do these firefighters describe the collapse of the North Tower? We started one. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, yeah detonated. They were planning yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. I was watching it. And others give similar descriptions. At 10.30, I tried to leave the building. But as soon as I got outside, I heard a second explosion and another rumble and more smoke and more dust. And then a fire marshal came in and said we had to leave because if there was a third explosion, this building might not last. Like, it sounded like gunfire. You know, bang, 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 bang. And then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. I started walking down the stairs. We made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Flew us back into the eighth floor. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like it, it, to me it sounded like an explosion, but it was a huge explosion. Chief Albert Turry told me that he was here after the events that took place this morning. He tried to get his men out as quickly as he could, but he said that there was another explosion which took place. And then an hour after, there was another explosion in one of the towers here. So according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. Reports of bombs in the buildings, explosions, a CBS reporter to Dan Rather. But I was coming um, toward the World Trade Center looking for CBS crews and asked a firefighter if I, he saw any. All of a sudden, there was a roll, an explosion, and we could see coming at us a ball of flame stories high. Listen to the sound of a large explosion right before the South Tower begins to fall. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers have to dive in. Sound reaches us after what we see. If the boom we just heard was the sound of the building collapsing, it would follow the collapse. Instead, the boom is heard before. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
bring it back. Let's consider the characteristics of steel. Steel is an alloy of iron containing added carbon for flexibility, workability, and strength. In the days of old, blacksmiths heated iron till it was red and pounded it for hours to form it. Horseshoes, knife blades, and plowshares were typical creations. Steel was introduced in the mid-1800s and by the end of the century, with the advent of the blast furnace, found widespread commercial use. A blast furnace is known as a controlled environment. High temperatures are reached as oxygen is pumped into a closed space. How and when does steel melt? Steel melts at temperatures of 2750 degrees Fahrenheit and above, attained only in a blast furnace or when a powerful incendiary such as thermite is used. Steel or any substance that is burned will never become hotter than the temperature of the fire or heat applied to it. An open-air hydrocarbon fire reaches a maximal temperature of some 1200 degrees Fahrenheit in a dirty or uncontrolled burn, characterized by red-orange flames. Red-orange flames are what we saw on September 11th. Even the fireball caused by the plane strike was red-orange. A controlled burn falls between a dirty burn like a fireplace and a controlled environment, the blast furnace. A controlled burn employs a regulated mix of air and fuel, an example being your gas stove or the engine in your car. You can fire up your gas stove all day long, making soup, roasting a duck, or simmering a stew. Made of steel, your stove will not melt, and nor will your pots and pans. This is a kerosene heater designed for use in any ordinary house. The heater runs on jet-grade kerosene contained in this tank. Made of steel, the heater can operate all night and all day. The kerosene fumes ignite and burn inside it, never causing even the smallest part of this heater to weaken or melt. Yet we were led to believe that these tremendous buildings, framed in steel and surfaced in aluminum, totally collapsed from small scattered fires and 90 minutes of smoke. MIT engineering professor Thomas Eager's 2001 paper is officially considered the academic standard for explaining the World Trade Center collapses. In it, he tells us that steel loses half its strength at 650 degrees Celsius and that the fires that day did not get much hotter than this. He stresses, however, that the fires did not burn evenly. It was the uneven temperatures that caused the steel to deform and some of the floors to fail. These falling floors brought down the whole building. While it was impossible for the fuel-rich diffuse flame fire to burn at a temperature high enough to melt the steel, its quick ignition and intense heat caused the steel to lose at least half its strength and to deform, causing buckling or crippling. This weakening and deformation caused a few floors to fall, while the weight of the stories above them crushed the floors below, initiating a domino collapse. In plain language, straight from MIT. do falling buildings look like? What do demolitions look like? We are seeing typical implosions, characterized by gutting a building's base and then pulling it into itself. 
Computer-controlled sequencing fires the explosives in a rapid wave. Notice the jets of shooting concrete, the flashes, the pops, the caving of the buildings as they fall into their footprint, the tremendous billowing clouds of dust. Now let's look at the collapse of the Twin Towers. We are seeing explosions rather than implosions, a first in demolition history. A sequenced rumble becomes a roar as debris is thrown outward. The damage is not contained. Even the windows are blown from neighborhood buildings. What kind of energy enabled this? Would fire hurl metal and concrete sideways into the air? Here, a 600,000 pound chunk of steel, twice the weight of a Boeing airliner, was flung 400 feet, wedging itself deep into three World Financial Center on Vesey Street. A FEMA photographer taking pictures of Ground Zero wondered why so many steel beams were jutting from neighborhood buildings. What shot pieces of the towers all the way across the street? In April 2006, New Yorkers were distressed to learn that bone fragments, human remains from 9-11, had been found on the roof of the nearby Deutsche Bank building. How in God's name did those fragments get there? It surprised me that there was still bone fragments or human remains that had not been discovered. How is it possible that after five years they're finally looking on the rooftops of the, of the Deutsche building? I mean, that's crazy. And bone fragments less than a centimeter long. How could they be so small? So much to be explained. Why did the South Tower fall first when it was the second tower to be hit? Watch the top of Tower 2 leaning outward, about to topple. Then, suddenly, it disintegrates in midair. What causes this giant slab of steel and concrete to turn into dust before our eyes? Watch both buildings collapsing straight down, directly into the path of most resistance, which is all the floors and all the mass of the building itself. The World Trade Center towers came down in approximately 10 seconds. Seismic data from Columbia University puts the North Tower collapse at about 8 seconds and the South Tower at approximately 10. Lynn Simpson, a survivor from the 89th floor of the North Tower, describes the site. And I saw the Trade Center literally collapse in upon itself floor by floor by floor and it took seconds for it to happen. It was a massive building and it just pancaked. 10 seconds. These are 110-story buildings coming to Earth at near free-fall speed, the rate at which an object drops through air. The lower floors would need to give way completely as the floors above them fell. Can a person walk through a closed door as quickly and smoothly as one that is open? A 10-second collapse means the upper floors encountered no resistance from the undamaged floors beneath them. Watch the demolition wave rushing straight down. Here the South Tower is half its original height, but wreckage from the upper collapse has not yet fallen this far. We are watching a demolition moving faster than gravity itself, a building bursting into powder from top to bottom. Here, 
here, the core of the North Tower finally gives up. 700 remaining feet of giant steel columns, among the strongest ever erected. What force acts upon the core to make it all of a sudden disappear? Professor David Ray Griffin is the author of Debunking 9-11 Debunking. Prior to his extensive research on 9-11, he wrote books in many fields, including the philosophy of science. For a believable theory about the Twin Towers, we must explain why these buildings, given the particular way they were constructed, came down as they did. Each building was supported by 287 steel columns. These columns ran from the basements through the roofs, and yet they ended up in a pile of rubble with most of the steel in pieces 25 to 50 feet long. This could happen only if these columns were sliced by some very powerful kind of energy. The towers came straight down, which could happen only if the columns at each level were sliced simultaneously. The buildings also came down at virtually free fall speed, which means the upper floors encountered no resistance from the lower floors. This could happen only by very powerful explosives set to go off in a particular order. The fact that the steel was sliced, the concrete pulverized, and the buildings came down at nearly free fall speed can be explained only in terms of forces much more powerful than the combination of fire and gravity. This is a pancake collapse. Why don't we see piles of floors at ground zero? And paper blown everywhere. Wouldn't a pancake collapse have trapped the contents inside? What blew this paper all over New York? If you were to drop a billiard ball from the top of the Twin Towers, it would hit the ground in just over nine seconds the average time it took for the towers to fall. Helped by gravity and falling through air, the ball will gain speed. The calculation for a pancake collapse of 110 stories with each floor pulverizing to get out of the way is 96 seconds. In the real world with the floors creating resistance, how would a pancake collapse occur in nine plus seconds as fast as a ball falls through air. The airplane struck the towers high above the ground. But down in the lobby of the North Tower, marble facing flew off the walls. The windows shattered, all the glass blown out. Right away, a guy from the Port Authority told them the damage was somewhere above the 78th floor. But all you had to do was look around. It was obvious something had happened right there in the lobby. You just saw that all the windows were blown out. The lobby looked like the plane hit the lobby. Like the plane hit the lobby. What caused so much wreckage in the lobby? William Rodriguez, a maintenance employee at the World Trade Center and the last human being to exit the towers alive, describes a giant blast below his building. And all of a sudden, we heard an explosion. It was a huge explosion that came from under the, uh, my feet, meaning that it came from the sub-levels between B2 and B3. And then there was a huge explosion at the top of the building. You could hear the difference from the bottom and all the way through the top. Uh, the one from the top, which was actually seconds after, uh, was heard very far away. The one at the basement was pretty loud and you felt your actual feet moving with, uh, with the floor. The tremor that is sent through the floors, that the walls cracked and the false ceiling uh, totally collapsed. And that's when a person uh, named Felipe David came running into our office saying, explosion, explosion, explosion. And when I saw him, he has all his skin pulled from under his armpits and missing pieces on his face. An explosion deep down in the tower before the plane crash 95 floors above. Others live to report enormous explosions below the towers. Construction worker Philip Morelli was in North Tower's sub-basement 4 at the time of the first plane strike. 
I go downstairs, the foreman tells me to go to remove the containers as I'm walking by the main freight car of the building in the corridor. That's, that's when I got blown. I mean, the impact of the explosion of whatever happened it threw me to the floor, and that's when everything started happening. Blown to the floor. Let's hear what happened next. I was racing, I was going towards the bathroom, all of a sudden, I opened the door, I didn't know it was a bathroom, and all of a sudden a big impact happened again, and all the ceiling tile was falling down, the light fixtures were falling, swinging out of the ceiling, and I come running out the door, and everything, the walls were down, and now I started running towards the parking lots. There was a lot of smoke down there, there was a lot of people screaming. People came with us running up the ramps. Philip then ran underground to the South Tower. You know, you got to go clear across the hole from one to one to two World Trade Center. You know what I mean? That's the way you got to run. And then all of a sudden, it happened all over again. Something else hit us to the floor. Right in the basement, you felt it. Walls were caving in. Everything that was going on. I, I mean, I know people that got killed in the basement. I know people that got broken legs in, their, in the basement. People that got reconstructive surgery because the walls hit them in the face. Engineer Mike Pecoraro in the sixth sub-basement found the parking garage and machine shop reduced to rubble. Rescue firemen and civilians spoke of hearing explosions throughout the towers. Firefighter Lou Caccioli told People magazine that as he and others evacuated workers, bombs were going off inside the building. Explosions stalled elevators and filled entire floors with smoke and debris. An William Rodriguez helping the firefighters reports blasts within the North Tower well before it fell. As I went up, I remember listening to small explosions on the upper floors, and these small explosions were not coming from the area of the impact. It was coming from lower floors. And when the second plane hit the South Tower... We heard boom! When we heard boom, inside our building, the North Tower, we heard pop, 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 pop. And on their security radio, we heard, we lost 65, we lost 65, meaning the 65th floor collapsed. And as we went down the stairwells, you could hear the actual collapsing inside the buildings. You heard rumble, you heard uh, the cracking of the walls, you, uh, I, I mean, pieces falling right next to us of uh, the actual building. What happened at the base of the towers just before they came down? Smoke appeared at street level. This video was shot from New Jersey. An explosion is heard as white smoke rises at the base of the building. Watch the camera shake on its tripod as a large energy source rocks the ground. Nine seconds later, the North Tower falls. I heard like an explosion and then a cracking type of noise. And then it sounded like a freight train rumbling and picking up speed. I looked up and I saw it coming down. As I came out of the North Tower, everything started trembling under my feet like an earthquake. The only thing I saw was a fire truck. I ran towards the fire truck and slid right under, when the building started to collapse right on top of the fire truck. A 
Across the Hudson River, Richard Siegel was filming an astonishing day. The sound meter of Richard's camera caught something very significant. Adjusted for the distance involved, as sound travels more slowly than what we see, the camera registered multiple explosions in the towers. Here is each tower's record. Let's look carefully at the collapse itself. Notice the puffs of concrete issuing from the sides of the building well ahead of the collapse wave. Called squibs in demolition language, these are actual explosives, charges firing visibly through the exterior as gravity pulls the building down. Well ahead of the collapse wave. Row after row of explosions. Engulfed by banana peel plumes, these were no ordinary implosions. The Twin Towers each consisted of three multi-story buildings set on top of one another. To sustain the weight of so many floors, the sky lobbies had to be extra heavily reinforced. Watch a big squib coming from the sky lobby band. Powerful blast produces what is called a shock wave. Explosions generate extremely high compressional waves that exceed the limits of surrounding air and space, creating a violent force. When the debris started coming down, I was right in the shadow of the South Tower. I was less than 100 yards away. Everybody saw the video over and over again of that cloud chasing people down the street. It was like a tornado. It was like being hit by a wave at the beach, but the wave was intense, it was hot, it was noisy. It was like getting hit in the back by gravel, rocks, like somebody had picked up handfuls of rocks and was just throwing them at you. And the noise kept coming and coming, and one second I was running, and the next second I was flying. I was just, um, I had no control over my feet, no choice as to what direction I was going. I, I was in the air, and it seemed like I was being followed by, by, this, by this tornado, this tornado of darkness. The South Tower fell first. This is the shockwave blast as it rocks the tower next door. As the buildings fell, they darkened Manhattan, filling the air with billowing clouds of dust and ash. What produces these huge, scudding, cauliflower-like masses of slowly moving dust? A volcano. Pyroclastic surge is the term for low-density debris clouds that sweep across land and even water in the wake of a volcanic eruption. Note the dust clouds pushing between the buildings and over the Hudson River, typical of pyroclastic surge. 
Volcanoes produce the same kind of thick scudding ash and debris following a massive release of energy, a huge internal explosion. The surge left a blanket of dust on the streets of Manhattan like a winter blizzard. Fine dust particles hung gray in the air. The towers were literally pulverized, rendered into ash. What kind of energy could transform a building from steel girders and concrete into millions of handfuls of superfine ash? Did the towers fall or did they drift to the ground in clouds of powder created in midair? Would jet fuel fires and collapsing floors result in this otherworldly scene? Filmed from space, a white-blue spire rises upward from ground zero, a military term for the site of an atomic blast or nuclear detonation. On the southern tip of Manhattan, surrounded by water, huge retaining walls were built below the World Trade Center to hold back the ocean and Hudson River. The bathtub, as it was called, held seven levels of parking garages, maintenance rooms, and the New Jersey PATH train station. After September 11th, the three-foot-thick slurry walls were found to have shifted up to 18 inches inward. These walls are coming in. These walls hold back the river. So if these walls cave in, this place is going to get flooded out by the river. Let's think about this. A pancake collapse should have left the foundations in place. They had always borne the weight of 110 floors. But something happened in the sub-basements to disrupt them. All the collapse had gone down to track level. So we had 60, 70 feet of wall totally unsupported. What kind of force could have dislodged so many stories deep underground? The ground continued to burn. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Molten steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Like a lava. The crews kept spraying, but still, underground, molten metal flowed and the fires burned on. You see how this debris is still smoking? That's when the fires that are still burning. Eight weeks later, we still got fires burning. Still toed boots is one of the biggest things. Out, still on the rubble, it's still, uh, I believe, 1,100 degrees. The guy's boots just melt within a few hours. In November 2005, physics professor Stephen Jones of Brigham Young University published a 25-page treatise on the collapse of the Twin Towers and Building 7, applying the laws of physics to the official story, from an interview on MSNBC. As we read in the FEMA report, it says here, and I put this in my paper, of course, the best hypothesis, which is the only one they looked at, the fire, has only a low probability of occurrence. Further investigation, invest, uh, analyses are needed to resolve this issue. And Professor, I agree with I am that. sorry that we are out of time, and I, I'm not sure that Whoa. Uh, you've uh, One you've other thing I want to mention okay, about... Okay, if you can hit it, uh, hit okay. it quickly. All right. there, there, okay, here we go. Molten metal in the basements of all three buildings. Right. And yet uh, all scientists now uh, uh, reasonably... Uh, agree that the fires were not sufficiently hot to melt the steel. So what is this molten metal? It's a direct evidence for the use of uh, high temperature explosives such as thermite. Thermite produces uh, molten iron as, a, as an end product. Okay. We appreciate your coming on, even okay. if I don't understand right. your theories. Okay. Uh, we appreciate your trying to explain them. Thanks. Professor Jones barely got in his mention of thermite. An incendiary used by the military Thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited, sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. 
This is thermite melting the engine of a car. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. The second product of a thermite reaction is aluminum oxide, visible as white smoke. Did thermite arson occur on September 11th? Watch this very bright substance pouring from the 81st floor of the South Tower. And white smoke appeared at the base of the building. Would this be aluminum oxide, the byproduct of a thermite reaction? Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. Let's look at what happens in the demolition industry. Taking down large structures requires preparation. Powerful explosives and heavy equipment are used in advance to weaken the foundation and bottom sections of a building before additional explosives and gravity bring the rest of it down. The words of a senior blaster. We blow the basement, all the columns in the basement. Then we crack it up at the top to get it started. We go every other floor all the way down. Every explosive has a timer on it, that's why it's controlled. When the columns go, each floor goes down and impacts the one below and keeps going. Here's what demolition experts use in steel-framed buildings. The linear shaped charge. It's a, a chevron-shaped or V-shaped charge that you can focus at a specific target and uh, it's lethal. It generates uh, around three million pounds per square inch pressure uh, at a speed, depending on the explosive inside the shape charge, in excess of 27,000 feet per second. Besides the unfathomably powerful shape charge, blasters have a lot of tricks. There are over a thousand different types of explosive, different because they detonate at varying speeds. This is detonating cord, and this burns at about 21,000 feet per second. Comes in all colors, pastels too. With the use of delays, we can control pretty much where the debris lands. We can control vibration. We can control noise levels. Uh, timing and delays are the key to just about everything in our business. And what is the result? The thing that pleases me is the, the fragmentation and the control. I wanted to take a building and break it up into millions of pieces and put it in this basement as artfully as we do it. And it works like, just like clockwork. So I've got it all down to a science. It just it gives me goosebumps to talk about it. Were the underground explosions intended to blow out the Twin Towers' basements, followed by blasts heard inside the buildings of shape charges slicing the core? The secondary explosion. We've got numerous people covered with dust from the secondary explosion. Demolition pre-weakening usually takes place well in advance of the final blast, but at the World Trade Center, critical prep work might have had to occur in a very compressed time frame in the panicked aftermath of the plane strikes. These core columns were discovered after the collapse. The angled cut occurs in exactly the manner that shaped charges slice through steel beams to control the way they fall. Notice the hardened once-liquid metal. Was thermite used with the shape charge? 
The job of the shape charge is to cut steel H-beams. The way we do this is by cutting the beam at an angle, which through a series of beams cut at the same angle will tend to make the building shift over and walk. Let's look at the rubble of two 110-story buildings brought to the ground. In a seven-story crater lie over a million tons of debris. Had the basements not been blown out, where would the rubble have gone? Heaped on the ground, ready to slide and spill? The art of controlled demolition. Remember the pre-collapse and mid-collapse explosions caught by Richard Siegel's camera on the Jersey Shore? Were these the blasts that took out the core and upper basements just before the final crumble? A mind-boggling sequence of computer-controlled delays that blew the exoskeleton, pulverized the concrete to bring the whole structure rolling to the ground. Was this the story of that day? Inside our building, the North Tower, we heard pa 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 And on the... People appear to have known the imminent future on that fateful day. FEMA had arrived in New York on Monday night, ready for a bioterror drill. Spokesman Tom Kenny to Dan Rather. To be honest with you, uh, we arrived on uh, late Monday night and went into action on Tuesday morning. And not until today did we get a full opportunity to work uh, uh, the entire site other than the spot of church and day to which we were deployed. And Rudy Giuliani, mayor of New York, tells ABC's Peter Jennings that he was aware the towers would be coming down. What is going on now is a massive uh, rescue effort. And do you believe it's hundreds or thousands? I, I, I really don't. I really, I really don't want to say right now, Peter. I, I think it's going to be ho a horrible number. I, I saw people jumping out of the World Trade Center. I saw some of the firefighters who I know going in, into the building. So. And we were in a building in which we were trapped for about 10, 15 minutes. And we set up a headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, which was right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, the head of emergency management. And we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. The World Trade Center was going to collapse. It was going to collapse. It was going to collapse. Similarly, Larry Silverstein, New leaseholder of the World Trade Center seems to have stated that a decision was made to pull Building 7 by the end of the day, the last structure added to the World Trade Center complex. Let's hear Mr. Silverstein's actual words, delivered for our benefit in the 2002 PBS documentary America Rebuilds. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. Blast, shoot, blow, and pull are terms used in the demolition industry to refer to bringing down buildings, bridges, and other structures. Because I actually blew the hospital down that I was born in. Uh, originally, we had figured to shoot it, let it drop straight down. Then, watch demolition dynamics attempt a big blast. And from Ground Zero's own post-disaster wrecking crew. By mid-December, the Department of Design and Construction had leveled World Trade Center buildings four and five. Hello? Oh, 
we're getting ready to pull building six. Silverstein, a commercial real estate tycoon with international political connections, acquired a 99-year lease on the World Trade Center complex in the spring of 2001. Throughout the summer, he reworked the insurance policies on his new property, making sure that it was covered for acts of terrorism. Explicit in the lease agreement was Silverstein's right to rebuild the complex if it were destroyed. After 9-11, Mr. Silverstein fought his insurers in court to obtain double his policy limits for the destruction of his property, maintaining that the double hijacking constituted two disasters caused by terrorists, not just one. In all, he collected over $8 billion, a magnificent return on his original $14 million investment. My first reaction is to think about the families uh, of those people, the tragedy, the magnitude of it. Um, however, I firmly believe that we should rebuild. Just in the last few seconds, another building, building number seven, one of the buildings uh, in support of the World Trade Center towers has collapsed. World Trade 7, functioning as the command center for the complex, housed giant diesel backup and oxygen systems, the mayor's protected emergency bunker, and offices for the CIA, Secret Service, Department of Defense, and Securities and Exchange Commission. Its other tenants were insurance companies, brokerages, and banks. No plane hit Building 7, but at 5.20 p.m. on September 11th, it collapsed in a heap on the ground. Some damage to Building 7 is said to have been caused by debris from Tower 1, though this New York Times article tells us Building 7 burned like a giant torch, the only visuals that exist are of unidentified smoke and a few small fires. Compare this to the wallop sustained by World Trade Center 3, 4, 5, and 6. Positioned right below the towers, damage to the surrounding World Trade Center buildings was infinitely worse. Still, the structures held up. But somehow, rescue workers knew that Building 7 would fall. You hear that? Keep your eye on that building. It'll be coming down soon. They said, hey, you know, like you got to stay behind this line because they're thinking about taking this building down. They're not sure if it's uh, stable or not. So they were holding a line off because they had knowledge that something was going to happen. Get out of here. All right? Go. In this live BBC footage from September 11th, reporter Jane Stanley announces the collapse of Building 7 while it is still intact in the window behind her. How did BBC know this in advance of the event? Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. There's almost a sense downtown in uh, New York behind me, down by the World Trade Centers, of uh, just an area completely closed off as the rescue workers try to do their job. But this isn't the first building that um, has suffered as a result. We know that part of the Marriott Hotel next to the World Trade Center also collapsed as a result of this huge amount of falling debris from 110 floors of two, the two Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. As you can see behind me, the uh, Trade Center appears to be still burning. We see these huge clouds of smoke and ash, and we know that behind that, there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city, but uh, completely disappeared now, and New York is still unable to take on board what has happened to them today. Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. I mean, th there were, I suppose, fears. A 47-story skyscraper, Building 7 folded neatly in six and a half seconds, a textbook descent right into its footprint. 
Silverstein Properties now tells us that its owner was referring to the team of firefighters inside the building when he spoke of the decision to pull, pulling the firemen out of harm's way. However, there were no firefighters in Building 7, according to FEMA, NIST, and Fire Chief Frank Fellini. They were ordered out at 11.30 that morning. Six hours later, the building came down. You know, we heard this, this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder. Turned around, it looked like there was um, a shock wave ripping through the building, and the windows all busted out, and you know, it was, it was horrifying. About a second later, the bottom floor caves out, and uh, the building followed after that. Radio host Alex Jones notes the mark of a classic implosion. This is a photo taken one second into Building 7's collapse. Notice the crimp. If we look at other controlled demolitions, we see that they first blow one of the central columns so the building falls in on itself. If you don't do this, the building falls outward and can damage surrounding structures. Building 7 had a classic crimp or wedge. Its central column was blown out first so it didn't structurally damage buildings just a few feet away from it. Remember the mayor's emergency bunker? Ensconced on the 23rd floor of Building 7, it was retrofitted with super glass, water, oxygen, and its own generator. But Mayor Giuliani chose to find emergency shelter elsewhere on September 11th. Why Building 7? Its structure was heavily reinforced. As the WTC command center, was it the hub for the 9-11 plan? Also, in six and a half seconds, lost forever were thousands of SEC case files on corporate fraud, including those relating to the notorious activities of giants WorldCom and Enron. A few indictments for stock fraud, but what of the $70 billion California electricity swindle? It disappeared. No one died in the collapse of Building 7. It was vacated well in advance of its implosion, but not the Twin Towers. Why weren't police, firemen, and civilians in these buildings told what to expect? Tragically, employees in the towers were advised to return to their offices. The announcement came on that everything was fine. Tower 1, they were evacuating, but Tower 2 was fine, and we could go back to our offices. We were about to go through the turnstile. The security guard says, where you guys are going? I said, well, I'm going home because I saw fireballs coming down. He said, no, your building is safe. It's secured. It is safer to stay in your building. Go back to your office. Stanley Priamnath returned to the 81st floor. Then... I just happened to raise my head looking straight towards the Statue of Liberty. And what I saw was a giant airplane coming straight towards me. The South Tower was hit between the 78th and 84th floors. Trapped on the 81st floor by crushing debris, Stanley was rescued by Brian Clark. Slowly and painfully, they made their way down a stairwell to freedom. Outside, Stanley had a feeling of uncanny prescience for what was to come. And we peered through the railing, up through the trees at the tower, and Stanley said, you know, I think that tower could come down. And I don't know why I'm telling this man this building is going. But I knew it was not over. I said, there's no way, that's a steel structure. That's just draperies and carpets and furniture burning. You know, there's no way. And I didn't finish my sentence when the tower started to slide. And I can still remember hearing, first of all, this boom, boom, boom explosion. Not all were blessed with intuition or foresight. Joseph Milanovic reached his son Greg by cell phone. Greg at that time, um, I could tell by his voice, was scared. Uh, he said to me, uh, Dad, can you get in touch with someone and tell them that there's about 20 of us on the northeast corner 
of the 93rd floor. Greg had been about to leave the South Tower after the North Tower was attacked, but was told it was safer to return to his desk. A couple of times he said, why did I listen? Why did I listen? Who was a director in the company that provided electronic security for the World Trade Center and Washington's Dulles Airport, both involved in September 11th? None other than the president's younger brother. From 1996 to 2000, SecureCom installed what was referred to as a new security system at the World Trade Center. Wirt D. Walker III, a cousin of the Bush brothers, was CEO of SecureCom from 1999 until 2002. Interestingly, these facts have not been made public. Was it only a security system that was added during those years? or was it also the wiring for a long-awaited plan? Scott Forbes, an IT specialist in a firm that had leased space in the South Tower since its erection, reported an unprecedented power down in his building for almost the whole weekend prior to 9-11. We were notified three weeks in advance of the power down by the Port Authority. That was relatively short notice to plan to shut down all of our banking systems. It was a big deal. It was, a, it was unprecedented. We had a data center on the 97th floor. So our originating servers were all there. During that weekend, the power down meant that there was no security. Uh, the doors were all open, basically. And also the security video cameras were all off. But there were guys in overalls carrying huge toolboxes and wheels of cables walking around the building on that weekend. Employees were notified that internet cables were being upgraded. But who were the strange workmen and what were they really doing? All the power was shut down. If there was a power down, that meant that everything was uh, gone in terms of uh, security, in terms of uh, access to the building. So anybody could have gone there and do any kind of uh, setup. Having worked overtime to get his company's servers back up, Scott took the day off on September 11th. As he watched the towers collapse from New Jersey that morning, he was sure this had been the purpose of the mysterious weekend work. Scott notified many authorities, including the 9-11 Commission, about the unusual and lengthy power outage, but was ignored. Ben Fountain of Fireman's Fund spoke of unusual evacuations ordered at the Twin Towers during the weeks before September 11th. Others reported that the security alert was inexplicably lifted five days prior and bomb-sniffing dogs were removed. What would the dogs have discovered had they remained on duty? Not long after the disaster, Lower Manhattan saw banners like this one. Although they were idolized as cathedral-like symbols of power and triumph that pierced the New York skyline, the Twin Towers were big money losers for the Port Authority of New York. They cost millions a year to equip with the basics, electricity, water, heat, air conditioning, sewage, and even oxygen, being airtight. As modern communications connected traders from all corners of the globe, tenancy in the Twin Towers continued to drop. The towers presented another problem. Decades ago, their steel beams had been sprayed with fireproof asbestos, a cancer-causing material banned from use in building in the mid-1980s. Although the World Trade Center complex was given several waivers, it was expected to clean up its act. But to remove the asbestos from every supporting beam in the Twin Towers would have been almost undoable. Quotes for this cleanup ran over a billion, and no insurance company was willing to bear the cost. An urban renewal project of unfathomable proportions. Given the tower's issues and problems, September 11th proved an unexpected bonanza. The Trade Center was built in the 1960s to revive a rundown area of New York, 
and 40 years later, urban renewal could again take place. Two white elephants were removed, and a brand new complex is in the works. The full height of the new Freedom Tower will soar to 1,776 feet. The suffocating dust that engulfed Manhattan was much more than dust. It was pulverized concrete, glass, metals, containing lead, mercury, dioxins, benzene, and of course, asbestos. None of that was healthy for any living thing. Today, thousands of rescue workers have developed lung cancer and serious permanent health conditions. And the rescue dogs continue to die. What you had was a ground-level municipal incinerator that smoldered for months, burning up the most heavily computerized building in the world. Patients have had black paste coming out of their pores. They have reported bowel movements that are blue or green and have smelled like smoke, despite the fact that they have not been at a fire scene for months. Only three days after September 11th, Washington instructed the EPA to declare Manhattan safe and reopen Wall Street, though the air remained toxic. A federal judge is blasting the former head of the Environmental Protection Agency for telling New Yorkers it was safe to return to their homes and offices near Ground Zero soon after the 9-11 attacks. The judge called Christine Todd Whitman's actions, quote, conscious shocking, and refused to grant her immunity. It was documented that the White House ordered EPA to tell these lies, to downplay the seriousness of the environmental hazards. In addition, 9-11 first responders who have fallen ill and applied for aid have been denied. Asbestos plays a part in the myth of why the Twin Towers fell on September 11th. The steel had been sprayed with a lightweight fireproof foam, which, while cheaper, was much less adhesive. The New York Times has reported that the foam fell off easily, and the Port Authority had been fixing and replacing missing sections in the months before September 11th. But even if the fireproofing had been perfectly applied, the impact of the plane crashing into the North Tower was so powerful, it simply blew most of it off, allowing the fire to attack the steel beneath. Once the planes hit, whatever condition it was in uh, before the fact, made no difference because an impact would not get off and the fire would have devastating effects on the steel. One good smack from a jet plane and the puffs of asbestos are all blown off the steel. Would a few hundred doors slamming do the same thing? Here, the History Channel tells us how due to poor fireproofing, flames swept through the pockets between floors. As much of the fireproofing had been dislodged on impact, the flames were attacking unprotected steel. When steel is not protected, the strength reduces very fast. When you get to about 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you lose about half the strength of the steel. The fire inside the towers may have reached temperatures of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The New York Times has reported what happened to those steel floor trusses then. The steel did heat up and it became softer and softer, almost like licorice. And eventually, all the steel had been weakened in this zone. Forty years ago, the steel used to build the World Trade Center was certified by Underwriters Laboratories, a global product compliance and public safety guardian. Let's hear a lone voice that spoke out from this enormous company. Hey, my name is Kevin Ryan, and I'm formerly a manager at Underwriters Laboratories. I was fired from my job five days after sending a letter to a government scientist at the NIST questioning the report that the NIST had recently released in October of 2004. I wrote this letter because I had serious questions about what I saw in the report. Those questions went back to September of 2001 when UL's CEO came to our location in South Bend. 
He told our entire staff that the World Trade Center steel had been certified by UL, and he said that we should be proud of how long the buildings had stood. Over the next two years, I did some research and found some very disturbing facts, including that the steel had been disposed of in an unprecedented manner. Once I discovered those facts, I sent a written question to UL CEO asking him about these things and what he was doing to protect our reputation as a company. He replied in writing to me that UL did, in fact, test the steel. He talked about the quality of the sample and how well it had performed in the tests. And he said that our company had tested the steel and that it had done beautifully. After that, he asked me to be patient and wait for the NIST report because UL was working closely with them. I saw this report in October of 2004, and in November, I sent my letter to NIST asking for clarification. I felt it was an obligation on my part to ask the questions since no one else seemed to care to. After the 1993 bombing, the fireproofing in both buildings was updated considerably. But when you look at the NIST report, you don't see any testing that showed that a 767 would widely dislodge the fireproofing under any impact, let alone so far from the point of impact. So now we've been left with a new theory that is not really a theory at all, but only a collection of vague statements. The NIST report represents what can really only be called anti-science. They started with their conclusions and worked their way back to some leading hypotheses. When the results of the physical test showed that the temperatures were far too low to soften steel and that the floors could not have collapsed and that the fireproofing could not have been widely dislodged, the NIST ignored these results and built a black box computer model that no one can argue with and that would spit out the right answers. Today, anyone who's conscious enough to know what's happening in the world knows that most government policy is being driven by this false story. Crack down and punish the perpetrators of this attack. This is being seen on Capitol Hill as another Pearl Harbor, as another Pearl Harbor, as another Pearl Harbor. The steel in dragon-like lengths and contortions spoke for itself, bent, deformed, without cracks. I found it hard to believe that it actually bent because of the size of it and how there's no cracks in the iron. It bent without almost a single crack in it. It takes thousands of degrees to bend steel like this. Typically you'd have buckling and tearing on the tension side, but there's no buckling at all. There's no buckling at all. Here is the meteorite, molten iron fused with concrete. And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. It is true that heat expands steel. In a fire, steel members may swell and bend slightly. But this, how could these huge tangles have been created? The steel below the towers had melted at many thousands of degrees. Since metal conducts heat, were these twisted remains formed by high temperatures wicking their way through a gridwork of steel? Explosives also deform steel. As they fire, gas pushes outward. The force of the gas can easily bend a large steel column. kinds of debris, huge shattered columns that could break a truck, combined with matter that was near pulverized. I haven't seen a door, I haven't seen a phone, I haven't seen a computer, I haven't seen a doorknob. You don't find a desk, you don't find a chair, you don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad and it was about this big. In 1886, four gold miners lost their lives in an underground explosion. The bodies of these four men were brought to the surface in one barrel. The biggest piece recovered was part of a foot. September 11th left over 1,100 bodies unaccounted for. At ground zero, 
This was found inside a length of steel. And before they sealed this up with the sheetrock and all the building materials on the interior face, the workers would sometimes put beer cans and the newspaper that we found, the New York Times paper, was we found in, in a similar spot to this. Secrets cannot be kept forever. Just as that newspaper from 1969 revealed itself to us decades later, we will someday know the inside of September 11th. The reasons for the staging of such a production go far back into time. Insurance policies covered nearly everything in the World Trade Center that was destroyed. But what if certain commodities could be removed in the nick of time? Gold and silver held by commercial banks and the COMEX exchange is said to have been stored beneath ground zero. This single cash belonging to the Bank of Nova Scotia was unearthed and made public. Was there more and was it removed remains a question. As last survivor William Rodriguez climbed the stairwell to rescue people, he remembers a very strange thing. As I stood there on the 33rd floor, I heard very strange noises on the 34th floor. Now, the 34th floor was an empty floor, a floor that did not have any kind of uh, walls or it was a construction uh, uh, floor. It was totally hollowed out. There was nothing there. And I heard very heavy equipment being moved around. And it sounded like... Uh, dumpsters with uh, uh, metal wheels being moved around. And I got scared because I knew it was an empty floor. Nobody was supposed to be there. As a matter of fact, not even the elevators stopped there. You have to have a special access key to open the door on the 34th floor. So to find that there were strange noises there, and I continue actually bypassing that floor because I didn't dare to open the door on the 34th floor. Something told William Rodriguez not to mess with the 34th floor. I got scared. Yet William Rodriguez was not a man who was scared that day. He remained in a burning building against firemen's orders, endangering his own life as he saved the lives of others. What could have been happening on the 34th floor? For weeks, Scott Forbes had heard similar noises on the 98th floor above him. It must have been at least um, four to six weeks before 9-11. It, it was like rebuilding work going on upstairs. The tenants, the people from Aeon who had been there were moved somewhere else. The offices were just vacant. And there was a lot of heavy machinery building work going on. It was almost like pneumatic drills and lots of hammering. So much so that the floors were shaking. That's how noticeable it was. It was almost as if uh, something heavy was being moved and then it was being taken off wheels and it was like boom! Our floor underneath literally shook. You could feel the weight above you. That was how large it was. On one occasion, I opened the door to see what was going on being nosy. When I opened the door, the whole office space was empty. There was nothing there at all. It was quite bizarre because it was just empty. Completely empty, barren, nothing. Zero. Not even cables hanging from the ceiling, but there'd been these heavy noises and vibrations up above. It was really strange. And the noticeable dust in the building the week before. It was probably the week leading up to 9-11. Every morning I'd come in around 7 a.m. and the dust was incredible. It was filthy. It was like the cleaners weren't cleaning. Right where the windows were, there was a sill which enclosed radiators. I was sick to death of the dust which was appearing on the window sills. It was um, dirty grey and very, very noticeable in that week leading up to 9-11. Where was that dust coming from? Grey dust Scott himself had to clean. Was it powdered cement? The steel columns of the Twin Towers formed an endo and exoskeleton. Had something been placed around the edge of the building, holes been drilled to contain it? Was the dust in those final days a telltale sign? As white elephants, the buildings were full of vacant offices, 
Tenants could be temporarily moved around for upgrades as Aeon was, and a plan arranged to perfection. Was the strange construction that could be heard but not seen going on all over the towers? Larry Silverstein took possession six weeks before September 11th, when the strange construction began. Were the sounds that scared William Rodriguez the last of the rats as they left a sinking ship? By taking a day off, Scott Forbes saved his life. This woman was not so fortunate. She is 9-11's Iphigenia, calling soundlessly to people who could not help her. Christopher Hanley, trapped with 100 people on the 106th floor of Tower 1. Fire Department 408, where's the fire? Yeah, hi, I'm on the 106th floor of the uh, World Trade Center. We just had an explosion up here. What building are you in, sir? One or two? One World Trade. All right. Yeah, there's smoke and we had about 100 people up here. Sit tight. Do not leave, okay? There's a fire or an explosion or something in the building. All right, I want you to stay where you are. Yes. Kevin Cosgrove, trapped on the 105th floor of the South Tower. There's smoke in there, 105, two pounds. It's really bad. It's black. It's iron. My wife thinks I'm all right. I called her and said I was leaving the building. I was fine. I'm bang. Two three of us, two broken windows. Oh, God! Let's not forget these people whose fate on this day was decided for them. As we know, secrets cannot be kept forever.
Are you tired of editing? Me? Yes. No. Are you filming me? You are, huh? Mm-hmm.